All right. Well, fellas, welcome. Welcome to um, Christian Maturity Session 7, Instructions for Christian Living. I am your host, David Martinez. I want to also welcome anyone that will be joining us online this evening. Thank you so much for your time, your sacrifice, and your commitment to becoming a mature believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so this is Session 7. This will probably be our last session for the year. It's amazing just how much we have been able to cover in our small time together. And I forgot my little clicker while I have it, but I don't know what happened to the USB, so I will have to just manually do it. So um, without further ado, I just wanna pray a sin real quick. God bless you, brother. Uh, Father God, again, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for the church that you built on the rock where the gates of hell should not prevail. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. We thank you for the word that has been preserved for generations, uh, uh, Lord, so we can have access to it today. So thank you for the word. Thank you, uh, Lord, that we are able to come together and examine your word as it pertains to how we can continue to grow as mature believers, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we just pray that you will have your way in our study this evening, Lord, as we examine the text out of Ephesians chapter 5. Lord, we pray pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will grant us clarity, articulation, Lord, as far as the words that are going to be coming out of my mouth as it pertains to breaking down this lesson today, Lord, and that the Holy Spirit will continue to grow inside of our heart as the word is implanted in our heart and may it move forward in our actions. So, Lord, again, I pray for anyone that's present here today and those that are online receiving this teaching. Lord, I pray that you will continue to grow them through your word by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Again, welcome to Christian Maturity Session 7. I am really thankful and excited about this lesson this evening because I'm going to be honest, I didn't have anything in my mind. I was wondering where the Lord wanted me to go. We had just did an amazing study last week on Jesus being a vine and the branches. I was like, well, Lord, where do I go from there? And after I got home from yesterday's message, um, you know, I turned open you know, to the scriptures and I pop right here in the same text that we've been doing our program philosophy out of Ephesians chapter four. Uh, and he showed me the instructions for Christian living, which is it, it follows right after the verse that we have been breaking down. And so I was like, Lord, that makes so much sense. And I just love how the Lord just brings it all the way back around. I tell you, I'm not that smart. It's all the Lord's do it. And I'm just really thankful that he gave me this uh, for this evening. So Without further ado, listen real quick. We just want to um, look over. This is from week one through three. Just a small breakdown. We talked about the program philosophy. We define what it means to be a Christian. We define Christian maturity, what it means to be a disciple, how to become rooted. We review what it means to repent. Uh, deny yourself, pick up your cross, display the roadmap. We did the reflection assessment handout. Uh, we reviewed the parable of the folk sower, define being rooted, the importance of examination and devotion and application, which we'll be doing a small review today because we're going to be circling the block. And since this is the last session on Christian maturity for this year, it's important that we just review a, a few of these things here to bring it all together. We did the parable of the wise and foolish builder. Just I'll quote that a little bit here. Uh, uh, towards the end of today's lesson, we discussed the importance of discipleship. We reviewed the components of the gospel message. How to know how to define the gospel, because if you can't define the gospel, how are you going to remain faithful and apply the gospel in your own life? We discussed who Jesus is. Like that is such a huge component, depending on how we answer the question, who do you say I am, will really determine how you live your life for Jesus. I mean, period. Discuss the importance of submission to Christ, submission to the gospel, submission to the discipleship process, submission to the will of God, submission to the Holy Spirit, and submission to others. Praise the Lord. Uh, and then the content for week four, we explored the outcome of submitting to the will of God, how to be transformed, conformed, and we review certain examples of transformation. We talked about here. I got to I got to get used to this here because normally I have the clicker. We talked about how the Holy Spirit is your helper, how to be converted, turn to God, your response, repentance, be sanctified by the word and through your obedience. And then we did week five or weeks. Uh, yeah, week five. Did I go too far? Let's see here. Week five. Yeah, we continue to explore our response to the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When it comes to maturity, a lot of it has to do with our response. 
Like if we want to become a mature believer, it really pertains to how we respond, how we apply, how we devote ourselves and things of that nature. So we continue to explore that, how Christian maturity connects to our response. We expanded, uh, we did an expanded view of the scriptural verse that grounds this program, uh, how Christian maturity is not possible without growing in the knowledge of God's word. You can't expect to grow in and, and become a mature disciple if you're not growing in the word. Uh, we talk about what it means to offer our lives as a living sacrifice, the priesthood of all believers. We analyze the fruit of the Spirit as part of a believer's growth response and maturity in the faith. And we talked about God's desire for holiness and perfection. And then, like I said, last week we did the parable of Jesus being the vine and we are the branches out of John chapter 15, 1 through 5. And on Sunday message, we've been talking about the parable of the workers in the vineyard and then the parable of the two sons. And then this week we'll be doing the parable of the talents. So we discussed the analogy of the vineyard from an Old Testament perspective. We discussed the tr a role of the triune God in the parable of the vineyard. We discussed what it means that God cuts and prunes the branches. We discussed the collective effort of the triune God as it pertains to this process of pruning the branches. We discussed what it means to abide in Jesus divine. We discussed the fruit of the spirit versus the fruit of the flesh. And we discussed what it means for disciples today. Man, isn't that a lot of content that we we covered over the past six weeks that's phenomenal and then content for week seven and i love seven because it's the number of completions so it really kind of completes the circle that we're doing this year we'll pick back up in the beginning of the year and i think we'll start emphasizing more on mission a little bit to kind of just really apply this christian maturity uh course in 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 our servitude so this week We'll again go over the philosophy program, uh, the program philosophy out of Ephesians 4 for retainment purposes. We want to continue to hound this as a memory verse. Uh, we want to continue examining the message to the church at Ephesus that teaches how the body of Christ can become mature from Ephesians 4 17 through 5 20. So Paul encourages corporate maturity. But he doesn't sit there and leave it at that. He goes into extensive detail when it comes to how we can mature. So we're going to examine what it means to put off and to put on that will encourage Christian maturity. We'll discuss what it means to follow God's example. And we'll conclude today's session on some spiritual practices a believer can apply individually and corporately that will facilitate Christian maturity. Perfect. Program philosophy. You got your Bibles. You can read this with me or you can read it up here, up here on the screen. And I have Ephesians chapter four, verse 12 through 13. And so Christ gave him, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. And their role is to quit his people, God's people for works of service so that what the body of Christ, the corporate body may be built up. And remember that word to equip means to furnish, to furnish. And we talked about how the furnishing to the, to the, to the spiritual house, how that all connects until what we reach. So the whole goal of God sending or Christ sending the prophets, the event of the, the pastors, the teachers was to achieve a certain objective. And that objective is to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge. So unity in faith, unity in knowledge, unity in doctrine, unity in the interpretation of this gospel of Jesus Christ, unity in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That is the goal. That's the corporate goal that Christ has set for the church, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then the verse comes, it keeps on going. Paul, this is to the church at Ephesus. And this is the result when we achieve this common goal corporately, starting individually, we will no longer be tossed as infants back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking, this is our response to this grace of God. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each member, each part of the body of Christ does its work. Praise the Lord. 
So what does it mean to become mature? We covered this in lesson one, but I thought it would be good for us just to be reminded real quick what it means to be mature. It means to become full. It means to become grown. It means to become an, an adult, to go from one stage to another. We displayed that roadmap from going from an infant who's just a new believer to becoming a mature believer who is an adult in the faith. This is an analogy used to become complete and perfect, to become finished. This is what it means to become mature. And according to the Greek language, meaning brought to its end, finished, wanting nothing necessary but to completion, perfect, consummate in human integrity and virtue, full grown, full of age, mature, completeness. This is what it means to mature. This should be our spiritual goal, our spiritual objective, something that we long to achieve in our life. I find it that a lot of believers don't mature because they don't have maturity as a spiritual objective to achieve, to accomplish. I know in just our worldly life, we like to set a plan. We like to have a vision board and our vision board on it, it we want to achieve a certain promotion. We want to make a certain amount. We want to receive a certain level of education or we want to go on a certain number, number of trips. We have earthly goals. How much more important is it for us to set spiritual goals? We should constantly have spiritual goals as believers, no matter where we find ourselves on the scale of maturity, whether you're a new believer, middle believer, senior citizen or senior believer, we should still have some spiritual goals so we can continue to strive for perfection in our relationship with the Lord. This is what we are to do. And now as we go into session seven of tonight's course, we're going to be breaking down the text uh, on instructions for Christian living, which follows subsequently from the program philosophy of Ephesians chapter four, verse 12 through 16. So we'll be going through verses 17 all the way through chapter five, verse 20. So if you have your Bibles, we'll be talking now. Granted, I would love to do a complete exegesis on this entire passage, but uh, Minister Ellie has already done the letter to Ephesians already during her Tuesday night Bible study. So you can find that online if you're really wanting like an exegesis on this entire passage here. One, and I have three major sections to tonight's teaching. One, when it comes to becoming a mature Christian, it is important to understand that a believer can no longer live as they used to before they confess Christ in their hearts. Even though we are Gentiles naturally, we are not to live like Gentiles intentionally who live like pagans, who live in the world. So the first few verses that I want to point your attention to is verse 17 through 19. We are not to live as the Gentiles. So even though we're Gentiles, granted, and we come under a Gentile paganistic culture, we are not to live our lives intentionally as the Gentiles do, even as Gentiles. In verse 17, it says, so I tell you this, and this is what Paul insists. He says, and I insist on it. In the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So they have their mind is darkened, their hearts are darkened. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. In my next slide here, I have a person who lives according to the world cannot think the way that God wants them to think. Their understanding is clouded. Their hearts are darkened because they do not have God. They do not have the Holy Spirit and remain still in a state of blindness to the truth. We are not, even though we're Gentiles, we're not to live as Gentiles because if we live according to the paganistic culture, according to the ways of the world, 
our understanding will be clouded and our hearts will remain darkened. And the result of a person living according to the patterns of the world results in them being susceptible to all kinds of immorality, impurity, and unholiness. Now, I know a lot of people that don't practice the faith will like say, well, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, and always try to prove to others that they're a good person because they don't have faith. They don't practice it. So they find themselves constantly trying to prove that they're a good person. But even those are still susceptible to immorality, to all kinds of impurity, because they don't have the spirit of God inside of them. They don't have a personal relationship with God. So at any given moment, they can have a moment where they respond in a way that's unholy and unpleasing to God. Look what it says. This is my brother's, one of my brother's favorite verses here. First John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world. Even though we're Gentiles, we are not to live our lives as Gentiles who are conforming to the patterns of the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So the scripture is clear. James 4.4, 4, do not be friends with the world because if you're friends with the world, you would be what? Enmities. You would be at, you'd be an enmity of God. And I put this other, this other diagram here of the world. The world is used in the context to describe any act, any person, any device, any instrument in the world that opposes the person and will of God. So you have the will of God, you have the world, and you have the will of God. The world is contrary to the will. The will of God is contrary to the world. So they use this compare and contrast of God's will and the world. If we live in the world, we cannot fulfill the will of God. You can't, you, you can't straddle the fence. Choose the day whom you're going to serve, the world or the will of God. It's either or. It's only two sides of a coin. There's no shades of gray here. It's one or the other. First John 5, 19. What does it say here? This is why we can't live our lives conforming to the patterns of the world because we know that there's still an enemy that exists. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under, I like, it says power or I like the influence or the sway of the evil one. So this is why we're not to be partners with the world because Satan is still on the loose and he is in a sense still influencing many in the world to follow after him. We have to be careful with that. Look at this quote that I find here from D.L. Moody. It says, Moody, it says, Christians should live in the world, but not be filled with it. A ship lives in the water, but if the water gets into the ship, she goes to the bottom. <laughs> so Christians may live in the world, but if the world gets into them, they sink. Their minds are clouded and their hearts are darkened if we allow the world to get inside of us. I love that quote by D.L. Moody. The consequences of being in the world is what? According to the text, according to these few verses of scripture here, a person is not in their right mind, essentially. A person is morally unresponsive. A person lacks knowledge. They're ignorant. A person's heart remains, as my other brother would say, unregenerated. A person is callous to the ways of God. A person remains in the kingdom of darkness. This is why Paul encourages the church to not live as the Gentiles live. He says, and he says, I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. He's speaking to the Gentile church. So they're able to connect with this message because they themselves are Gentiles. They know about their culture. They know about the things that they did during that time that was inconsistent with the will of God. So this is the consequences of being in the world. 
Paul even said a little bit of leaven ruins the entire batch. So we have to be careful with certain ways, certain practices, certain things that the world does. We cannot participate in some of those things. Now, it's not to say that we can't at times maybe go to a movie or something like that and, you know, have a good time with our family. But even we have to be selective with what movies we watch, Amen. what music we listening to. Ain't no, I know we live in a day and age where we play video games. A lot of my kids play video. You got to be selective with what video games you play. You know, it's like we have to be selective with the things that we do practice as Christians, as believers. We'll talk a little bit more about what it means to put off and to put on, too, according to the text. When Paul encourages the church to become the mature body of Christ, he proceeds to tell them in verses 17 through 20, what will prevent the church from fulfilling God's will? It connects all together. So he's encouraging them to become the mature body of Christ so that they can reach unity in the faith and unity in the knowledge of God. And then he proceeds to tell them, well, these are the things that's going to actually prevent you from becoming mature. And that's living as, as the world lives. It's living as the Gentiles live who are living according to the patterns of the world. This will prevent you from becoming the mature body that Christ wants us to be. When it comes to becoming a mature believer, you have to, for us, believe, we have to know, we have to rely, and we have to apply the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the message that was given to the church by the apostles. We have to apply this word. Any questions? We good? Acts 2.42, look at what they look at what they did here. After the new believers uh, um, you know, were pricked to the heart and they asked, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized so you can receive the forgiveness of sins and so you can receive the Holy Spirit. And shortly afterwards, what do we see the early disciples do? The early Christians do? They were continually devoting themselves in Acts 2.42. I mean, we're just, we're just brand new into the book of Acts and look at their practice. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and they devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to coming to the temple every day. They had to apply these things in order to become one in faith and become one in the knowledge of God's word. They had to come together. And this is the practice of the early church and at Christian Way Ministry. We try our best to mimic these practices of the early church. So in verse 20, it says that, however, is not the way you learn, meaning the way of the Gentiles. That's not the way that Paul is teaching the church. The apostles have taught the church how the Gentiles were living during their day and age. That, however, is not the way of life you learn when you heard about Christ and were taught in him according with the truth that is in Jesus. So this next question I have is, so what were you taught that is in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus from verses 20 through 24. I'm glad you asked that question. Praise the Lord. Brings me to the second session, second se uh, section of our course this evening. When it comes to becoming a mature believer, you have to learn what it means to put off your old ways, your old habits, your old way of thinking and put on Christ's ways, put on Christ's word, put on Christ's characteristics and put on Christ's spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I put Christ as the as the definitive uh, uh, person as far as, you know, to be specific about what ways we are to adopt, because when you put God's ways, well, what God are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Jesus Christ makes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He puts the definition on God. So this is why I say Christ's ways, Christ's word, Christ's characteristic, and put on Christ's spirit. Because now we know 
which God we're talking about. <laughs> okay, look, there's a lot of gods in our culture today. So when you say God's ways, you'd be like, okay, well, what? Mm, like ways of the Greek gods, ways of the Roman gods, ways of the Indian gods. I mean, which gods are we talking about? Okay, so this is why I put Christ's ways because now that makes it more definitive. It makes it more exclusive. We're talking about the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when it comes to becoming a mature believer, we have to learn what it means to put off old ways and what it means to put on Christ's ways. God is good. And so when it comes to Christ's ways, let's just let's just go here. Verse 22, Paul will tell the church here, you were taught, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to what? Put off, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by his deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and true holiness. So here we go. Put off is the first category. Put on is the second category. So the first category here, when it comes to what you were taught by the church to put off your old self means to put off your former lifestyle. Mm -hmm to put off how you were living according to the world, to put off your sin, to put off your unrighteousness, to put off the flesh along with its evil desires and passions, and to put off what you learn from being in the world. Part of becoming a mature believer is to unlearn what you learn. And that's difficult because before we came to Christ, all we knew was the world. And then when we come to Christ, now we have to develop and build new habits, a new way of thinking, which you can't do by yourself, which God will equip you with Christ, with his word, and by the power of the Holy Spirit to now begin to develop new habits, a new attitude, um, a heart that's regenerated for God. So we have to put off the old self. And sometimes we will have to intentionally do that because temptation will come. And when temptation comes, how are you countering that temptation? You have to continue to live your life in the new while putting off the old. And once you make it a habit of doing it, then you'll get to a point where it becomes second nature. Like I remember I got involved with a lot of addictions. And one by one, I started to put them off. And at first it was a struggle because, you know, the body and the flesh desire these addictions. But once I made it a habit of not engaging in my former lifestyle, now it just became, and now I no longer desire those things. So that's what it means to put it into practice, to discipline yourself. We'll talk a little bit about this here shortly. Look at this. I have two images here. One image is an individual that is taken off, in a sense, his dirty clothes. And the second image is one putting on his new clothes. So in a, in a, in a, in a figurative perspective or a figurative way of putting this, take off the old outfit of your former life and put on the new outfit of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but it's something about putting on a brand new outfit. I mean, literally, <laughs> and you, you know, you come out, you got your new, you got your new shoes on and you stepping out, you feel good. You feel good. But that's what it, that's what it should feel like when you take off your dirty sin, you take off your old ways and you put on the ways of Christ. You're like, man, you know what? This is way more satisfying than when I was living my former life in the world. I have been set free now from my addiction, from my former way of life. Look, it says in um, Colossians 2, 11 through 12, here go a, a couple other verses that match with what Paul is saying. And look, if you notice, when you get a chance, go back home and just read. When you read Ephesians, go back and then read Colossians and see how similar the message is to both congregations, really similar. Like here, in him also you were circumcised with a uh, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, 
This circumcision only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not physical circumcision that was done under the old covenant. But, but, but it says by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ through the spirit, obviously, having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Notice that language here in verse 11. It says, in him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh. So just that word here, to put off, is mentioned here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. And just thinking about the Greek word for put off here, mentioned about eight times in the New Testament. But just to give us further clarity here, it means to lay aside, to lay down to cast off, to lay apart. This is what it means literally and figuratively, all right? To just put it off, to put it off. Amen. This is the way of the cross. This is the way of the cross to get rid of our former life, to put it down, to put it to death, to mortify it. Look, in Luke chapter nine, verse 23, Jesus says to the disciples, if anyone would come after me, must deny himself and take up his cross. Not whenever you feel like it, but must take up his cross daily and follow me. This is the way of the cross. This is how God wants us to live our lives for Christ. We have to put off that old self, that old flesh. Look. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Minister Ellie is doing the Bible study on Galatians now. And he says here, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in a body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. Meaning I have died to myself because of what Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I now, in return, die to myself. I put it off. I put it away. I put it to death. I crucified it. And this is obviously in a figurative way. Look, Galatians in the same, in the same letter. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I mean, they put it off. They put it off. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5, 24 through 25. So many verses that talk about putting off our formal way of living, our formal way of thinking, our flesh, our evil desires, our passions. You know, living according to the patterns of the world. We have to put that off. Look, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, what is he? A new creation. What's gone? The old. We put it off. The old is gone and the new has come. Christ gives us a new attitude, a new heart, a new mind. He puts his desires inside of us. He gives us new purpose, new mission. He gives us a new identity. He replaces the old with the new in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? So what else were you taught that is in, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus? All right, and now when we talked about that same passage here, just from 20 through 24, we put off our former old life, we put off living according to the patterns of the world, and now we put on the new self. We put on Christ. We put on true righteousness. We put on true holiness. We put on the Holy Spirit. We put on the word of God. We put on a new heart. And we put on a new mind that thinks differently about your former lifestyle so that you can live a new lifestyle. So we put off the old and this is what we put on. You can't take off your old clothes and then remain naked. Because if you do that, what happens? You're going to go back to them dirty old clothes. And a lot of times, this is what happens when, when people get rid of an addiction, whatever it is, cigarettes, you know, pills, whatever addiction, there, there's a void. So when you take off the clothes, guess what? There's a void. Now you're naked. Now you have to put something on in place of it. 
And what are we putting on in place of it? A lot of times people give up certain things, but they easily go back to it because they didn't replace it with the things that scripture tells us to replace those old habits with. This is what we replace that with. Yes, sir. It's crazy that we talk about this because I posted something on Instagram like, over the weekend. And I literally, the post was, uh, I used to be, I had multiple addictions. I used to be addicted to a lot of things that yeah. people go through 12 step programs yeah. to come back and still relapse. I said, I took one step with Jesus Christ and I'm clean. Amen. That, 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 that speaks to the power of God, mm -hmm. the power of the spirit, the power of the word. I mean, yeah, they got to go through all of these steps just to try to overcome their past. But if you come to Christ and your heart is regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit and you put on these things that the, that Paul is encouraging the church to put on. Listen, you won't need to go through those 12 steps because he's giving you everything you need in Christ. That's why we have to be connected to the vine. Like I said in, on Sunday, from the vine, everything else flows. But if you're not connected to the vine, see that 12-step program should start with Jesus. <laughs> it should start from Jesus. But it's from a it's a secular model. So this is why they have all of these things to give you a, a, a fighting chance to, you know, to break free from these addictions. But Jesus comes to set the captives free. What, what free? What Jesus has to offer is so powerful that you don't need these 12 steps. You just need Jesus. And he will set you free. If you commit and you surrender and you repent and you remain connected, that's 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 how it is. Let's see here. I, I got that. We got that. And look, this, this image here. I posted this image uh, a, a few sessions ago. But notice how one is taking off their garment of the enemy. Because think about it, when you're living according to the patterns of the world, what are you living for? You're living for the enemy. You're living for Satan. That I mean, let's let's be honest. That's the truth. If you're living for the world, you're not living for God, then who you're living for? You're living for the devil. <laughs> so this individual here said, you know what? I'm tired of living for the devil. I'm going to go live for Jesus now. So he's taking off his devilish clothes, and now he's putting on Christ's clothes. All right? He's, he's putting off his former self, and he's putting on a new self. So this is just a, 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 an analogy of a picture here that kind of puts it into perspective. Look at this. Look at this verse here. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify. Put it to death. Mortify is an old English term here, and I like that. But mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Put it to death. What, and what is he putting to death? Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil con concuspiciousness. <laughs> <laughs> I messed that one all up. Bro, hold on. Let me let me go back here. Uh, let me see here. Put the death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So these are a bunch of fancy old English words here that I can't even pronounce, but you, you know what I'm saying, all right? Uh, so yeah, so mortify. It goes back to what we just talked about. Crucify the flesh. Mortify it. Put it to death. Put it off. This is the command that we must do. And if we don't do it, then we'll remain living according to the patterns of the world. And our hearts will remain darkened. And this is what it means to be converted. This is all going into conversion. Be ye converted. Turn to God. So when it comes to, you know, taking off the old and putting on the new, you're going through this process of conversion, this process of sanctification, this process of transformation, which we talked about. All right. And now as we continue to move on in verses 25 through 32, what else are you to put off and to put on that's consistent with the truth of Jesus that will assist you in becoming a mature believer? If we go to verse 25, Ephesians 25, 425, it says there, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let 
any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Look at all of that. Paul has given us a whole detailed outline of how to become mature individually and corporately. Think about it. Paul is sending this message to the church. He's not sending it to one individual like Paul sent a pastoral letter to Timothy and a letter to Titus. No, he's sending this to the entire congregation. So yes, this goes for us individually, but it was spoken and written to a collective body. This is the goal for the church itself to become mature and to apply this message here. Look, what you were taught to put off your old self, meaning to put off falsehood, lying, pretending, deception, to put off uncontrolled anger that would lead to sin, rage. When we get, I, and like I said, I was just talking to you about a building that they just put up uh, and it was turned into a rage center where people can come in and just go ham on just letting out their anger, whether that's on a TV or any, any device or item that they could damage and break and get their anger out. Now we got these rage centers popping up all over the place. Why is that? Maybe is it because we have an issue with controlling our anger and letting our anger get the best of us? They didn't have these raid centers back in the first century. So what did they do to manage their anger? Yes, we have feelings. We have emotions. And at times things happen where we get frustrated and we get angry. But we can't allow that anger to consume us. That's what rage is. Rage is a consuming anger to the point where it becomes uncontrollable. So Paul is telling the church to put off uncontrolled anger, put off this rage, because if you don't, it's going to lead to sin. Put off stealing. Obviously, this was a problem during that time where people were stealing. Don't be stealing. huh? Put off laziness. And where did I get laziness from? It says anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, verse 28, but must work doing something useful with their own hands. Put off laziness because if you're stealing, you're being lazy because you're trying to make a wage or gain something without doing it the proper way. You're being lazy. You're taking the easy route. So we have to get rid of laziness. We have to work. We have to be useful. We have to be productive. Another thing that we're to put off, unwholesome talk. I can't tell you how many professing Christians I come across that use certain language because it's consistent with the language of the culture. Mm -hmm. To put off unwholesome talk, anything that's corrupt, and I put it in parentheses, anything that's corrupt, rotten, bad, of poor quality. We are to speak a certain way because why we're ambassadors for Christ. We're representatives for Christ. We are his followers. We are his disciples. We represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we have to conduct ourselves accordingly. Put off every unrighteous act that would grieve the Holy Spirit that is dwelling inside of you. He's saying don't dwell the Holy Spirit. I mean, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, how can we grieve the Holy Spirit if we don't put off these things? Then we would be grieving the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is supposed to be residing in us. But if we are fooled with rage, guess what? We're grieving the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is supposed to be inside of you and you're supposed to be exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. And one of that, one, one fruit of the Spirit is what? Self-control. So don't grieve the Spirit. And if we grieve the Spirit, it's because we're not being intentional. We're making sure we control and practice our faith. Some acts that you were taught to put off your old self, meaning some acts that would grieve the Holy Spirit, include the things that he mentioned in the text itself. Bitterness, poisonous fruit, by the way. That's what bitterness represents. Poisonous fruit, uncontrolled anger, quarreling, heated arguments, and any evil talk. 
This is part of that verse in 31. Get rid of all bitterness, uncontrolled anger, rage, and brawling, quarreling, and slander, heated arguments with every form of malice, evil talk. These are just some synonyms to go alongside of these things that we're to put off. I know heated arguments was something that, hey, I'll confess it, that I struggled with a little bit. When I first came to the faith, I was ready to debate everybody. Matter of fact, before I came to the faith, I was debating everybody. <laughs> I was a debater. I was hot-headed. I was an angry kid. I'm not going to lie. And I, the Lord had to work with me on a lot of that. And, you know, recently, especially with politics and stuff, I remember six years ago, I was still kind of really insensitive. And I was just kind of speaking whatever, you know, that came to my mind, you know, as far from a political level, you know, and I was having these heated debates and these arguments and that was not the way of God. So the Lord had to continuously grow and mature me as well. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this here uh, when it comes to how we should speak and how we should address our brothers and sisters. And remember, this is being spoken to the church. Look, here go another one, Colossians 3, 9 through 10. It's another corroborating verse of scripture. And notice that I got Ephesians and Colossians and a lot of these slides here because the message is almost duplicate. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on what? The new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So here we have the analogy of putting off and taking off. God is good. And so in these same verses here from verse 25 through 32, not only does Paul give us another outline of what to put off, but he gives us another outline of what to put on. You were put, you were uh, taught to put on your new self, meaning to put on holy productivity. It says here, in verse 28 again, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands. Be productive. God gives you two hands and two feet, but we have to honor those gifts that he's given us by being productive and serving him in a way that's holy and honorable. Some other things that we are to put on, speak only things that are holy that will encourage and help build others up in the faith. Verse 29, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but oh, it says, but only, this is to the church, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That is a lot in itself. Because how, how easy is that to slip away from our mind when we get caught up in some frustration or we get caught up in a pickle and we're having a back and forth with someone that we may disagree with? That's something that, you know, hey, could I continue to grow in this area here? Why not? Yes, absolutely. We'll confess that. So now I'm just having to learn what it means to just speak those things that are just going to help encourage others' faith. You know, and those that it's just like, okay, well, God bless you, you know, I mean, and then just keep it at that. Because at the end of the day, some have already decided in their own mind what they're going to do anyway. So having that heated back and forth is not going to matter when someone is already sold. So this is why we have to use discernment and discern whether or not an individual is really willing to learn, really willing to listen, really, really willing to, you know, come and meet halfway or whatever and then you got others that at the end of the day it's just it is what it is and so now instead of having that back and forth with them now we just try to speak only those things that are going to help encourage them help build them up and then keep it moving because anything else is of the enemy for real look other things that we are to put on kindness and compassion again these are fruit of the spirit and and compassion compassionate means tender-hearted being sympathetic Sympathizing, sympath, uh, sympathizing with them where they are to meet their needs. This is something that I do as a hospice chaplain. I go into a situation and it's not about me. It's about trying to connect with this person where they are, being sympathetic to their situation, even providing empathy to them as they're going through a very difficult time in their own life. 
That's part of being compassionate and then forgiving each other as Christ forgave you. Paul is speaking to the church to forgive each other so that they can accomplish the overall purpose to become unified and to become the mature body of Christ. Can you imagine a bunch of Christians coming together who have nothing but unforgiveness in their heart for each other? How would they ever grow corporately to become unified in faith and unified in the knowledge of God's son? Just can't do it. This is why and Paul knows this. He's being led by the spirit. And he's like, listen, if you do these things here, you will become this mature body. But be careful that you don't harbor any unforgiveness for your brothers and sisters that are worshiping you in the same congregation. Because if you do, guess what? You're not going to grow. Not going to grow. All right. Any questions or any comments before we move on? All right. We good? Okay. So here we go. Ephesians chapter five. Verse one, continuing right on, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. To follow God's example means to follow Christ's example by picking up your cross and following him as his disciple, which means what? When it comes to following Christ's example, following God's example, to humble yourself, to serve the Lord and others, to surrender to the will of God for your life, to live your life as a living sacrifice, one who sacrifices their own life to live for Jesus and to manifest what we call here a fragrant offering that sets forth a Christ-like example to others. Some of us are wearing a cologne, not anybody here or anybody online or something, but I, I come across certain uh, uh, people that have confessed Christ or profess Christ, but yet are exhibiting a fragrant offering that's not consistent with the fruit of Jesus Christ. Meaning it stinks, <laughs> right? It stinks. The fragrant offering is not pleasing unto God because their fruit is inconsistent of their profession, of their confession of faith. We want our fragrant offering to match our actions and our lifestyle for Christ. Look, it says here, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are to duplicate that example. That's why Jesus said, whoever would come after me must deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow me. You must exhibit an offering, a fragrant aroma that's pleasing unto God, that others can recognize your example of Christ. And then he says, you must walk in the way of what? Love. Like, look at how much substance we have here. And I'm breezing through this, but I could just literally stay on some of this here. I could develop a whole probably sermon series just on this, on, on these verses here from Ephesians 4, what? 17 all the way to 520 like I would I would probably be here two three hours trying to break this all down but I'm doing it and passing in a sense but he says you must walk in the way of love this is fundamental to becoming the mature body of Christ we have to walk in the way of love to follow God's example means to walk in a way of love which means to walk or to be full of goodwill to be well pleased. This is what love means in the original language, to wish well for someone, to be fond of, to the regard the welfare of another, to take pleasure in something, in God, in this case, and his people. Because we can take pleasure in a lot of things, but in the context, we take pleasure in the things of God, in the things of Christ, in his word, in the Holy Spirit to prize it. This is what we do. This is the way of love, to prize it above other things. Remember, we can't have anything that we love more than our relationship with God. So we prize it above everything else and unwilling, and we are unwilling to abandon it or do without it. This is the way of love, to welcome with desire, to long for it. This is the way we are to walk. Walk 
in the way of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record for wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. This is the way we are to walk. Now think about this. This is a huge and a tall command that we on our own strength and our own flesh are incapable of fulfilling this. This is why Jesus said, look, don't go until you receive power from on high because you're not going to be able to accomplish the will of God without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need God's power. We need God's spirit. We need the word to encourage us and to inform us and to teach us how we can become mature believers. Thank God for the word. Where would we be without the word that describe what it means to walk in a way of love and other things that we've been talking about? Look, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one. This is the new commandment, the new commandment. And this is the only commandment that's described as new. And what does it involve? Love. Love one another, not as you love yourself, like the old commandment or the second greater commandment uh, spoke about under the old co uh, covenant. But no, the new, the new commandment I give you is to love one another as I have loved you. This is reciprocal love. Jesus demonstrates that agape, unconditional love on the cross. And in turn, we display that towards God and we display that towards other. This is how the world would know you are my disciples if you love one another as I have loved you. Thank you, Lord. John 13, 34. So moving on to the next part of our text this evening. And I know I'm going to be running a little behind today, and I apologize, but we're going to get through this. What else are you to put off and to put on that is consistent with the truth of Jesus that will assist you in becoming a mature believer? Let's continue on in the text in verse chapter 5, verse 3 through 18. And we'll read it all together. And it says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coerced joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Wow. Again, we have love to be able to break down these 18 or these 15 verses here from an exegetical standpoint. But there's just no way I can do this. So I will have to summarize it. Uh, in a nutshell, to put it all together. So some other things that Paul speaks about in regards to what we are to put off as far as our old self means to put off sexual immorality, fornication, all forms of sex, except between a husband and a wife. And I know in a culture today that's very sexualized, 
where we live in a taste test type of culture. You know, we test before we commit. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the word of God is very clear in regards to what sexual immorality is. So we just have to be careful because if we engage in sexual immorality, it will hinder our spiritual growth. It just it's just the truth. It's just the reality. It's God's word. And I know for many that are single, that may be difficult, you know, um, but there is something to be said about the blessing that comes with being single, too. You know, until the Lord provides you that spouse or whatever. Now, as a single person, that person now can devote a lot of their time to the Lord, really focus. Unlike with a, a, a husband and wife, the husband and wife now have to please each other and at times that could take away some of that devotion to God because you know we you know we're married and now we have to make sure we honor our spouse but when you're single you have now an abundant opportunity to really prioritize your relationship with God so when it comes to the things that we should put off old oh, tough meaning sexual immorality that's one of the most you know um engaged worldly practices that is prevalent across cultures it, it just is what no matter what culture you go to you can find an abundance of sexual immorality being practiced all right so this is one of the things that we see over and over and over again throughout the new testament throughout scriptures in regards to sexual immorality another thing to put off impurity especially as it pertains to impure motives Mo your motives your heart your posture it, that's important a lot of times we do things but we do things from the wrong motive so we have to be careful with those motives we have to question those motives are they pure or are they impure to put off greed overindulgence gluttony which is a form of idolatry greed is a form of idolatry covetousness is a form of idolatry we can't cover our neighbor's belongings yeah we covet a lot of stuff covet a lot of stuff so we got to put off that greed. We got to put off that overindulgence. We got to put off obscenity, coerced joking, humor that is inappropriate, that could be offensive or hurtful. Mm -hmm. I know at times we like to joke around and we like to play around, but we have to even be conscious of when we are, you know, having fun. We can't just have a free reign and have fun however we want to have fun. No, there needs to be a limit on that as well. Can't just joke however we want to joke. Some joking can be very offensive to others, and we have to be mindful of that. We always have to, before we even say it, hey, how would that person may interpret what I'm about to say? And if there's any question, any doubt, don't say it. <laughs> don't say it. Rule of thumb, don't say it. If, if there's any question about it, hey, it's probably not a good idea to say it. Put off any association that represents the kingdom of darkness. Put off drunkenness, any addiction that would inebriate your mind. All right, look. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us take off. Let us put off. Lay aside. There go that word. Lay. There go that word. Put off every weight and sin that clings so close. Look, sin is crouching at our door. It desires to have us. But the Lord told, uh, the Lord told Cain, but you must master it. Unfortunately, he didn't do what was necessary to master that temptation. All right. And then here we go again. What were you taught in this same passage in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 through 18? What were you taught in regards to what you are to put on? Okay. In this passage, we see a couple of things here. To put on a heart of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. We're entering into the season of Thanksgiving. Happy early Thanksgiving to those that are present here and those online. A heart of thanksgiving. Put on the light of Jesus Christ that removes any deeds of darkness. Put on goodness, righteousness, and truth, which comes from the word of God. Put on the wisdom of the Lord through the word of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit that will enable you to follow God's example and that will help clothe you with the righteous characteristics of God in your life these are the things that you are to put on put off put on put off like like uh, mr miyagi wax on wax off okay so we want to wax off a formal lifestyle we want to wax on the ways of christ amen god is good all right moving on third last section here so these are the last couple verses here that we're going to be talking about this evening 
All right. When it comes to becoming a mature believer, it goes back to what was taught in week two in devoting yourself to certain spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines that will enable you to facilitate your process of maturation, according to verses 19 through 20, which says, instead, be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another with psalms. This is written to the church. I keep saying it with psalms, hymns and songs from the spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So even when we're coming together and we're worshiping and we're singing songs of praise, that should also contribute us to becoming that mature body because we're singing praises in unity and in faith. And that should lead to our corporate maturity. So he's telling us to do these things, but how important is it also to do these things individually as well? So it goes back to devotion. What we talked about in week two, we have to devote ourselves to certain spiritual practices and certain spiritual disciplines. And what is devotion? Again, loyalty, fidelity, dedication, faithfulness, affection, and enthusiasm. So we're devoted because we're excited, we're enthusiastic, uh, we're we're in, uh, we're enthusiasm, enthusiastic, enthusiastic. Yeah, see, I'm struggling today. I'm struggling today. My mind ain't working like it used to work. Okay, I'm tired. Enthusiastic. Thank you, brother. I appreciate. It. I was like, man, what is that word? Tongue twisted. Yeah, but that's what devoted means. We're enthusiastic about doing these things for God. We have a new spirit. We have a new heart. We have a new mind. And we're excited about doing it, all right? And we too, I quoted this from the lesson, from a Christian perspective, devotion means to center your life on the object of your worship, Jesus Christ, by performing certain actions that will establish your roots in the faith, which will ultimately contribute to your spiritual maturity. This is devotion. Look, remember, becoming a true disciple cannot occur without true discipline. If you don't discipline yourself, you're not going to grow and become mature. I remember that when we were used to work out in the gym, we had to discipline ourselves to actually make it to the gym a certain amount of times throughout the week. And we had to discipline ourselves to focus on a certain part of our body. And like we did that in the gym, now we have to take that and apply it to our faith. All right, so we have to discipline ourselves. Look, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. This is what it means to discipline yourself. I discipline this body. I force it to do what I want it to do. I don't let my body control me. I don't let my thoughts control me. I don't let my feelings control me. I control them by the power of the spirit, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Basically he's saying, look, if I don't discipline myself, what's gonna happen? I have to do this. I have to be committed. I have to be devoted. Because if not, we know what happens. Ephesians 5, 19 through 20, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for the things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are things that we can devote ourselves to to become mature. Just some things. Some things. Look, look how consistent this is to Colossians 3, 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with what? All wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with what? Gratitude, thankfulness in your heart. Look how similar this message is to the church at Colossae. Other spiritual practices that a disciple should discipline themselves in practices and practicing includes what? Daily prayer, periodic fasting, servitude to the church, meditation on God's word, capturing every thought. It's, it, it, that's a spiritual practice. How are we controlling these thoughts that come in and out of our mind? How are we controlling these feelings? That How are we testing every spirit with the spirit and putting on the whole armor of God? 
I, these are just some, right? Put on the whole armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and the boots of the gospel of peace. This is the armor. We got to practice putting on this thing so that we can what? We're stand the wiles of the devil. Why? Because like we said earlier, the whole world lies under the influence of the evil one. We got to apply this thing here. There's a real spiritual battle. And look, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet and the hope of salvation. We got to we got to walk in the way of love. We got to practice this. We got to discipline ourselves as believers and become the mature body. I had to discipline myself to prepare this lesson today. I had to discipline myself to prepare the message for yesterday. I had to get up at a certain time in the morning and I had to discipline myself. I had to sit at that dining room table and I had to go to work. This does not just happen just by me being lazy and not disciplining myself. I have to discipline myself to do this. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, another thing that we can practice right here, the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all. Your, I mean, I'm telling you, if you love God with every ounce of your existence, you're going to devote yourself. You're going to want to do everything that pleases the Lord. Because you love, it starts with love. Walk in the way of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as we close, application, application, application. We done had seven sessions of this. But if you don't apply any of what is being taught, then you're not going to grow. It comes down to the response to God's grace. Are we applying this word in our life? We too, to become rooted in your faith and to become a mature Christian means you have to apply the word of God in your life. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, you become a student of the teacher. You become an apprentice that is being trained to become like the teacher. Matthew seven twenty four. Therefore, whoever would hear these words of mine, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And think about it. When you do apply this word and you devote yourself to it and you walk in a way of love, whenever the storms do come, the famine, the natural disasters, whatever happens, you are standing firm on the rock. It's not going to move you. Why? Because you have been training yourself. You have been disciplining yourself. You have been putting this into practice. You have been applying your faith. So not even the storms are going to be able to sway you. Look, you got two examples. One that's not moved by the storm. And then you have the account of Peter. When he was walking on water and Jesus told him to come. And as soon as he started coming, he saw all the storms and what happened. He began to sink. Why? Because he wasn't applying it. He began to have anxiety. He began to worry. He began to focus on the storm versus focusing on Jesus. We have to focus on Jesus. Look, Hebrews 5, 13 through 14. For everyone who lives on milk, this is a new believer, is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. He hasn't became a full adult. But solid food is for who? The full adult, for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. And when you train yourself and you discipline yourself, guess what? You will have discernment. You'll be able to distinguish between good from evil. You'll be able to test every spirit from the spirit. You won't be able to be blown here and there by every wind of doctrine as an infant would be. But because you have solid food, because you are mature, because you are practicing your faith, you'll be able to stand firm. You'll be able to spot the enemy a mile away. I'll be like, oh man, that's it. All right, I see you. Not the day saying. Romans 13, 11 through 14. 13, 11 through 14. And it says, and this do, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay, put off, put to death, mortify, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave 
properly. This is the concluding verse. As in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. This is what we are to do if we are to become the mature body of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we want to become mature individually. And this concludes our seventh session on Christian maturity instructions for Christian living out of Ephesians chapter four, verse 17 through chapter five, verse 20. God bless you all. Any question, any concluding comments from tonight's lesson? That was a lot. A lot of substance, but substance is what's going to propel your maturity. We can't always give you just baby food. At some point, we got to give you meat. We got to give you oatmeal. We got to give you something thick that's going to stick to the ribs. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. Any questions? Anything else? Y'all good? Thank you guys so much for coming out today. Thank, for, thank you all that are online who are seeing this course this evening. Let us pray. Father God, again, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your word, which is sharpened in any two-edged sword. We thank you, Lord, that this is the seventh session on Christian maturity, where we get to examine the text out of uh, Ephesians, Father God, when it comes to instructions for Christian living that followed right after Paul encourages the church to become the mature body of Jesus Christ in unity, in faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Father God, we are just so blessed that you have preserved your word for so many years, Lord, that we even still have access to read it for ourselves today so we can understand your instructions. We can understand what your will is, not only for our lives individually, but also for the church corporately. And so, Father, we pray that we will make it our spiritual goal, our spiritual objective to become the mature body. Father God, help us to grow from being an infant to a full adult Lord who is standing firm and applying the word of God in our life. So Lord, we know that to be a disciple means we must discipline ourselves. We must go into strict training. So help us to set certain goals in our faith, Father God, so we can continue to facilitate that disciple making process, that process of becoming a mature believer. So Father, again, I thank you that you have given me the energy and all that I need to get through another lesson this evening. Father, I give you all the praise, honor, and glory because without you, I would not have been able to put all of this together. So Father, I thank you so much. I pray for those that are going to be accessing this teaching uh, at some point, whether it's this evening or at a future time, Father God, that the the seeds that have been planted and watered, Father, that you will continue to add to the increase. So, Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the word of God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you for coming out this evening. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Remember, we won't be coming back up until the beginning of the new year. So we'll come out with dates in regards to when we'll have our next session. All right, signing out.